Hi, I'm Wally Smith. This paper is a collaboration between HCI researchers, myself, Greg Wadley, Sarah Weber, Benjamin Targ and Vasilis Kostakis at the University of Melbourne, and psychologists Pete Caval, also at Melbourne, and James Gross at Stanford University. About two decades ago, key thinkers in HCI, such as Don Norman, Jody Felizzi and Katja Batterby, drew our attention to the need to address emotion and experience in design. Since then, a generation of now ubiquitous and familiar technologies has emerged that subtly influence people's emotional responses across a range of settings. In this talk, we speculate that this relationship between technology and emotion may be moving into a new phase in which people are no longer just the passive recipients of designed in emotional effects, but rather they are now actively using these technologies to manage their own affective states in response to life's daily challenges. This capacity to manage one's own emotions has long been studied and enhanced by psychologists in clinical applications under the label emotion regulation. And it involves such acts as seeking amusement when feeling bored, reducing anxiety to focus upon work, and in attenuating joy and amusement on solemn occasions. In the study that I now report, our aim was to shed light on the role that commonplace digital technologies are playing in emotion regulation in people's everyday lives as opposed to clinical interventions and settings. Several previous studies in HEI have reported specific forms of digital emotion regulation for isolated technologies like gaming and, and online shopping. In contrast, we were interested to find out the range of technologies that people are deploying for this purpose, how and when they are deployed and how these technologies may be shaping patterns of emotion regulation in everyday life. We chose to focus on office workers and to use a diary study in which they recorded relevant events over one week of regular ongoing life. Participants were first interviewed and instructed to record at least five episodes that involved emotion and technology. To, to ensure this was minimally disruptive, we asked them to keep simply images of apps or situations that would serve as later reminders. After seven days, the second interview was held using the images to reconstruct the episodes and probe which emotions and technologies and so on had been involved. We then conducted a standard six phase thematic analysis following Braun and Clark. Two things are important here. One is, is that to count as emotion regulation, um, episodes had to have an intention to alter an emotion. And secondly, although I've spoken only of emotions so far, we actually examined a more nuanced range of affective states including such things as feeling antsy or freaked out. The most striking aspect of our findings was the sheer extent of digital emotion regulation that was re reported. This is difficult to convey in a short talk, but here's one vignette from participant eight who reported all of the following things over the week, from extensive phone calls to friends, use of various social apps, binging on Netflix, um, gym class, a dance class, and various other apps and watching YouTube, mundane YouTube videos at bedtime to relax. This table from the paper shows the range of tools that are implicated across all of the participants in the study. And as we anticipated, these are mostly commonplace mundane digital tools like FaceTime and games like Words with Friends. And they include supposedly purely instrumental tools like email and weather apps. To explore the deeper meaning of our findings, we analysed them in terms of James Gross's process model of emotion regulation developed in non-digital digital contexts. The model identifies five strategy families shown here. The first one is situation selection, which in a non-digital context might be going to a movie to avoid a stressful family meeting. An example from our study was immersing oneself in a favourite audio book from childhood to remove oneself from a, the surrounding social situation. Situation modification is the strategy of changing a situation to alter its emotional effects. It might involve convincing a neighbour to tone down a loud party rather than get angry. And in our study, a case was resolving frustration at not going to the gym by watching an exercise video. Attentional deployment involves attending to aspects of a situation to get a more desirable emotional effect. 
And this might be, for example, distracting oneself from a depressing work meeting by thinking about vacation plans. And a similar case in our study was where somebody reported checking email to disengage from an unpleasant work situation. Cognitive change involves restructuring in one's mind the, the meaning one attaches to something to change its emotional significance. For example, comparing one's situation with that of a less fortunate person. And in our study, there were cases such as using deep dive Google searches to combat uncertainty around particular events like the pandemic, for example. Response modulation is the fifth category. And this is where people act on an ongoing undesired emotion, for example, through the use of alcohol or deep breathing or exercises. And this was reported in our study, for example, where people had a positive feeling for some good news, they prolonged it by sharing it on social media. So in many ways, um, our findings show that digital emotion regulation reproduces the same strategy patterns as traditional or non-digital uh, regulation. However, at the same time, there were subtle transformations in the digital realm that we discuss in the paper. For example, digital situations and the boundaries between them are more fluid than physical situations. People may juxtapose a work Zoom meeting alongside a social interaction and a game and glide between them. In such cases, the strategy families of situation selection, modification and attentional deployment become a little harder to separate. We drew three larger findings and conclusions from our study. Firstly, many participants had developed what we identified as emotional toolkits. That is, they described a disparate set of digital resources that could each be called on for a specific emotional purpose. For example, music playlists were designated in this way, and even instrumental apps like email or task planners were described as playing a specific emotional role on occasions. Secondly, digital technologies in our study were seen to be emotionally volatile and could become counterproductive. For example, the common techniques of checking news for reassurance and entering social interactions to alleviate negative feelings could also serve up emotional curveballs. We speculate that one reason for the rise of digital emotion regulation is to handle the undesired emotions that may be generated from digital sources. And finally, we tentatively suggest that the existence of digital emotion regulation provides a small counterpoint to some accounts of the harmful effects of technology and that sometimes what appears on the surface to be mindless distraction and overuse may sometimes deliver benefits of emotional coping and resilience. Thank you very much.